There are different aspects of my business, and so rather than belabor each and every one, I thought I'd bring along a sign that you can look at if you're interested. So it's back there, that nice little, hopefully, uh, you know, clear presentation. It gets displayed periodically in the window of a bank, so that made me think to start off this talk with the fact that when I signed up for the first time for this bank display, um, oh, that's okay, we'll you know, right but people can look at it okay. whenever. Thank you, though. All right. um, when I signed up for the first time for that bank display, the bank officer said she would first have to double check that they could allow this because the Funeral Director Association was one of their customers. And likewise, when I was looking for studio space, I went to the local zoning board to ask who owned a vacant location that I was interested in. They told me that they knew the owner didn't want to rent it for whatever reasons, but, and added, um, plus, I'm not sure that you would be eligible to rent that space, that we'd let you rent that space because you sell caskets. You're a funeral-related related business. Um, what? I exclaimed. And the man hastened to add that he didn't actually know what the regulations were in Arlington since he just started working there from another town, but that towns have the right and many do choose to restrict businesses related to death to within half a mile of a cemetery. So I share both of these stories with you as examples of the ways that we are sometimes being protected from thinking about death without our even knowing it, right? And that death care, like any business, is contested territory. Nothing new, right? Probably ever since the first burials that we know of occurred about 60,000 BC, um, researchers, researchers have discovered corpses adorned with elk antlers and shoulder blades, for example, and can't you just imagine somebody standing there saying, they like deer antlers better, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so we want to do right by someone when they've died, but what does that mean? So I was interested when you, that question was raised earlier. There's a book called Birth, Marriage, and Death, Ritual, Religion, and the Life Cycle in Tudor and Stuart, England. Pithy title, right? The author says his unofficial title for the book was Hatching, Matching, and Dispatching. <laughs> there were a lot of societal changes happening in the 16th and 17th century in England, and we can think of rituals as one of the stages that societal changes and concerns get played out upon. Um, I know we have an anthropologist in the room, and I wish I'd read all the anthropological ri ri you know, literature about rituals, but here's what I know. So this author of this book, David Cressy, says that rituals give cultural meaning to natural processes, right? And they construct a societal and religious framework for biological events. So we can think about how these same elements are in play as we negotiate these times, not back in historical England. I didn't start my business to make a political statement, and I'm not anti-funeral director. I actually spent three Julys as a teenager living above a funeral home with my aunt and uncle, my uncle the funeral director, and uh, babysitting my cousins, so I also really appreciate my aunt's backstage work, as a sociologist Irving Goffman would say. Right? Bas backstage, she was working really hard to keep those three boys quiet, and I know, because I, I tried it, you know. Um, but it was in the service of presenting a seamless, presentation that they felt was important, and I really saw that they worked hard. You know, they, um, they really tried to uh, provide the care for the families that they, um, you know, that felt right. And uh, again, how, how do things come to feel right is, is one of my questions, and as we think about uh, a lot of the issues that are being raised here tonight. So I also didn't initially know anything about the envir in environmental impact of our typical choices. I started Morning Death Studio because I felt an emotional need to have different options for myself rather than uh, the ones I'd experienced with the deaths of my parents and at other funerals I'd been to. The funeral industry is well aware of you know, the changes and people's desires to change the way things have been come to be done. The article I'm quoting was about 10 years old um, by now. A spokesman for the Massachusetts Funeral Director Association, Association said, 25 years ago, if I knew what church someone went to, I pretty much knew what the ritual was going to be. It just came along with that particular church. Now we have to struggle with how many options to present to people. Well, ideally, in a classic rite of passage, the ceremonies work to bring people together. Remembering Well, which is one of the books that I have brought tonight, says that funerals help to place a certain help us to place ourselves 
on a continuum of the past to the future and anchoring ourselves within the present, you know, within our community. So given this, we can see how it can feel even more isolating if the rituals don't fit with our belief system or the structure of the ritual activities doesn't somehow feel like it's supporting our connections. I was sorry to learn from a Washington Post article that in this bad economy, people are making funeral choices such as shortening the visiting hours. It's possible that more structured formal visiting hours may not be meeting people's needs, but I'd encourage us to focus on ways to come together rather than spending money on a casket, for example. Which is not to say that some of my caskets don't cost a lot of money. The first one I sold was the most expensive one I offer, an ecopod made out of recycled paper. It looks kind of like a sarcophagus. It is pictured back there too. It was, it was actually the blue one um, that is pictured there. I saw that it meant a lot to the daughter that purchased it. But I also care about making better choices available for all of us, better for the environment, better financially, better for us emotionally. Prior to opening my studio, I had a lot to learn about running a business, took small business association classes and so on. At least three people told me that the only way to sell green products was as a high-end luxury item. And that just isn't something I could do, but regardless, I strongly hope that this conventional wisdom is dated because we simply can't keep doing things the way they have come to be done. Usually I have lots of statistics that I would bring up about the urgent environmental impact, but um, I knew that they would be covered by previous speakers tonight. Although um, one that Joe Sehe gets, uh, puts out there a lot is, um, so I'll just mention it because he didn't say it, and I, I always say it is because uh, it, it stays in my mind, is that you know, metal caskets are the most popular choice in caskets. And every year in America, we bury more than enough metal to rebuild the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, every year. So I'd ask us to think about, you know, what meaning does that have? And I have actually seen a picture of a, a metal casket on the front of the globe. It was, you know, when a, a child was killed in a violent um, event. And I could feel the pull, like, oh, yeah, you know, you want to protect them, you know? I could feel that pull for myself, and I try to remember that we all, we bring so much in, um, to these decisions. But we can, if we can think about it ahead of time, we can, you know, see where we really want to come out in our decisions um, and of what we choose. Status and identity assertion are a fact in death as well as in life. Sociologists like Juliet Shore in books like The Overspent American talk, think about the impact of our reference groups upon our actions. Who are we looking to for our sense of what is to be done? Oftentimes, this is, uh, we tend to look at people who are financially ahead of us. So if you know, class is hard to, to define, right? But it tends to be people with more money, more prestige, more status. And so I love, there's an FCA brochure that I love. It's on their website for free. Um, it's called something like Simple and Cheap. And it's about, it's written um, by the daughter of Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black, who talks about going to pick out the casket with her, uh, for her father, uh, with her family, and with two other sitting Supreme Court justices. Well, actually, I don't know if they were sitting, but they were, she calls them, you know, Supreme, she, she gives their names. Um, and, uh, you know, her father has always given them, them directives. Uh, no open casket, he doesn't want. Fine. And simple and cheap. So they, they end up, uh, you know, she tells the story, they end up ripping off pink organza from the cheapest casket there to reveal the pine casket underneath. And he's laid out in state at the National Cathedral in that, which is where most of the dignitaries in Washington are laid out. So sometimes I think paradigm shifts happen, you know, with those kinds of examples. Um, but um, uh, Emma Crossan, uh, you made the observation once that I really like too. I don't know if you that I wrote it down. None of us can remake a ritual alone. It has to happen in community. If we had time here, it'd be useful to look at the bereavement literature because there's things about instrumental grievers, what it, the way it can help us to grieve and heal by putting, uh, you know, by taking action as well as it also can involve thinking. But, um, and there's resiliency uh, literature that talks about things that would help us, help us realize like when we are regressing under grief, under, under a crisis, you know, there's sort of like nine profiles of how people 
uh, cope. And sometimes, you know, you can have some conflict between those. And so if we know this, I think if we have the education about these kinds of issues, it can help us talk more. It can help us figure out what's going on. Um, as we envision how post-mortem options are changing, I'd like to be sure to look at class issues because guilt and shame can be easily triggered when grieving anyway. It's just kind of often sort of free-floating, right? And the link between money spent, dignity, and love can be especially painful for people who live their lives without a lot of money. If you Google cardboard caskets, you'll find an article about Claudia Wendell, who's a Lakota Native American woman, and an Episcopal priest, and a funeral director. And here's a quote. Wendell's biggest gripe about public aid funerals is with the recommendation of a cardboard casket. I refuse to do that, she said, her voice taking on an angry edge. Everyone who sees it says, ah, a welfare casket. We deserve better than that. So I love cardboard caskets, actually. Right? They're already a secondary waste recycled product. They biodegrade easily. They provide a great surface for decoration, which I you know, care about. And I am from a working class background originally, so I can relate to what she's saying. Right? Um, I recognize that the potential impact of class on what might seem like a straightforward choice can complicate the, the situation and the things that we're thinking about, but I hope to help people reconsider this perception. Um, I think that we have to reconsider a lot of things. You know, people mentioned the, you mentioned like, you know, the gasket ceiling is, you know, not worth the paper it's written on, but that's really, that was put out there, you know, really well educated people that we know, and someone who was the head of a university nearby, thought that that was legally required rather than a misguided attempt to, uh, an, an unsuccessful uh, attempt to prevent decomposition. Um, we could get used to, we could think about doing things differently. I was happy to hear about the uh, Boston, uh, British Columbia Cemetery. You know, we could get used to doing things like mounding. Uh, and not need vaults. You know, you've talked about, right, why can uh, someone who's Muslim do this? And, you know, we could reconsider a lot of these choices. But we do ask funeral directors, you know, the, the wife of a funeral director told me that someone called her husband up when the ground had sunk in the cemetery and held him responsible, you know. So we do, we have to, um, we could be thinking about all these things together, too. I would like to re-examine things, you know, I'm sure that things like maggots probably, you know, I can't, you know, decomposition is happening, right? But there's plenty of stories also that we could think about, about, um, on my website there's an essay from the woman who co-founded the studio with me about when she takes her daughter to a home funeral that was, uh, the person was laid out for three days and the 10-year-old ten, ten daughter, you know, tells her that she feels less afraid of death at the end of it. I talked to a man from Texas who says they have 10 days, and this is by his report and I should have, you know, confirmed it, but, uh, you know, he's planning a road trip in the truck with his dad and his brother, when his dad dies, you know. So he may run into some trouble if he doesn't plan ahead, right? He can end up with two schmucks in the truck. Or he can, you know, he could run afoul of things that he doesn't know about. But, um, but he actually was uh, at an FCA um, convention in Seattle, so I believe he's finding out about those things. 